thank you so much, everybody, for being here today. We're so excited to have you. Um, I'm Emily, I'm one of the uh, HACI members, also a member of EPC, um, so the English Ped Consultants Working Group. And uh, today we have the pleasure of being joined by Lisa Taylor, who is a prof at Bishop's University. And Gwen and I, as we just discovered, have had the pleasure of taking some of Lisa's classes. So and survive. Yes, we survived. <laughs> um, yeah, so she's from Bishop's University in the School of Education. Um, previously, Lisa worked um, at the Toronto District School Board, so over in Ontario, where she taught ESL for young adults, and she was also a facilitator in youth equity leadership camps. Um, and so there she had a chance to learn about Paulo Freire, about bell hooks, um, and about their work on critical pedagogy. Um, and she has also worked with Indigenous Mapuche, Mapuche teachers in Chile. And so she, I think we're gonna have such a great time learning from Lisa with Lisa from each other today, reflecting on culturally relevant and responsive pedagogy. Take it away, Lisa. Yeah. Thanks, Emily. Can I just ask everybody just to un unmic for a second and say hello so I can hear you? Hello. 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 Oh, that's Hello. The, it's like a big vocal hug. Um, it's one of the things I do to like I do it at the start and end of classes when I'm teaching online, just for us to do all of that. So, by the way, if you notice, we're going on a time warp way back to 2002. I don't know how that happened, but apparently, eh, 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 we are pre-pandemic. We are. Uh, I don't know where we are, but that's where that's where that's how my slide ended up today. So um, I want to say um, thank you for uh, let's see where I'm going to put my head. Um, thanks for joining. Um, thanks for just being with us. Um, I my agenda is kind of along a bunch of questions because that's how I think. Um, and the questions are kind of provocative. So Emily asked me about culturally relevant, responsive pedagogy. Um, and um, so I think at first we can take across, we can take apart culture and what we mean by that, and then move into pedagogy and um, think through some examples of that. We've got very short time. So um, first things first, thank you for just being here. Thank you for being in your classrooms. Thank you for the work that you do. Thank you for um, the difference that you make in your students' lives and in the lives of your fa of their families and their communities. Um, thank you. Um, I'm not a sage on the stage. I'm coming with um, to this with humility and admiration for the work that you do. So um, thank you. You are the heroes. We have many heroes, um, but you are amongst the heroes of this pandemic. So thank you. Um, and I don't know any more than you do. I know a hell of a lot less. I hope that um, whatever I have is useful to you. Um, so I put some stuff together and we'll see how helpful it is. So first things to first, um, huge round of applause, big, big hugs. I hope you're taking care of your loved ones and your loved ones are taking care of you. And thank you for taking, you know, being there for your students. Um, that's probably already 90% of your job in many ways. So um, culturally relevant pedagogy. What do we mean by culture? Um, how many cultures... So let, let's play around with what that even means um, when we say, what do we mean by culture? Actually, hang on, let me back up for a second. Um, there, I'm gonna throw into the chat a Jamboard. I've only got two questions on the Jamboard. So you will see um, on slide one of the Jamboard, yeah, um, you'll see, I just wanna know how you're doing today. Again, I love to start off this way, um, and I respect your time. I don't want to, uh, I don't want to not value our time together. But for me, knowing how you're doing today um, is part of knowing how you, of of what we're about to do together. Um, so, how is everyone? How which <laughs> in our in our in our various waves of the pandemic? How do, does everybody know how to use Jamboard? Um, you 
go down to the side and there's a little post-it note and in your post-it note oh you can also write but on your post and on your sticky note you can write things um and it's good for us to to do this because i'll have another uh question for you afterwards um so your sticky note you can choose your color my students have taught me you can also insert visuals which i did for the first time today with all the little emojis mm, things you learn um so uh someone circled the smiley face thank you um someone's in a great mood really good to know um i can uh i can i can second that emotion someone's tired but happy someone's doing okay recovering from covid working from home um yeah that's a lot to to juggle someone's feeling windswept uh feeling okay at least uh, the sun is out yay you're doing great but you're working like crazy yeah i get that we do way too much of that you're relieved good okay um glad to hear from you glad to know that we're in a place of starting together so now i can go on um to my next question if we're going to start talk talk about culturally relevant pedagogy um what do we mean by culture well let's experiment with that and if you go to the second page of the jam board the second page you'll see you can answer the question there um i know there's a there's another fancy way i could probably have this show up on the powerpoint but there's a you know I, there's how much there's a limit to how much tech we want to learn so on page two i thought i'd give you a chance just i'm i'm throwing this question out to you just as a rhetorical question for us to play with if i asked you if someone walked up to you on the street or a friend or a colleague said so how many cultures are there in your classroom what would you answer how would you answer that um so someone's answering Religious groups, national groups, sports fans, deaf culture, queer culture, people with disabilities, West Island community centers, brilliant. I don't know, two, several, yep. Very helpful. So obviously, even asking that question is, you know, having us think about what do we mean when we say culture? If we're talking about culturally responsive pedagogy, more than I think, oh, bless your heart, what an amazing critical pedagogue you are. Yes. Um, thank you for knowing. Thank you for pointing to the unknown knowns and the knowns unknowns, um, as that great philosopher talked about. Um, as many as there are students. Ooh, gorgeous. Um, different class backgrounds, too. Yeah, SES. So very many. You work in many schools with students from so many different backgrounds. And one thing for sure, um, our classrooms are a culture of caring. Oh, that's so great to hear. Um, that takes um, tremendous work on your part um, and on every part to, to create that. So um, I would say that it's worth us, um, it's worth us paying attention to, because the word gets thrown around so much, right? Um, oh, there are so many cultures at this school. Oh, I work with a lot of different cultures. Even that phrase, different cultures, tend to tends to point to certain groups and not others. Some, right? Um, let's just say that in Canada, um, folks like me, Anglophone Canadian born, um, white Canadians in um, Anglo Canada, and in Quebec, um, Francophones rarely get called a cultural group, right? um because we apparently don't have a culture because it's the mainstream right so we are rarely the we, we're rarely reduced to that kind of a name except when we're defending it uh -huh. there's a lot of that going on um but um one of the things that's really interesting and here i'm just going to ask you to unmike um uh why do you think that so many people when they say how many cultures are there in your classroom they're actually talking about ethno-racial groups any ideas because that gets used a lot those two get used equivalent as equivalent a lot i don't know i have a feeling that it has something to do with what you were just saying i i'm wondering if it has to do with white supremacy personally 
I couldn't hear the last word that you said. If it has to do uh, with white supremacy. And so culture and race get so ethno-racial groups get named as cultural groups. And like, um, yeah. dominant cultural groups don't get named as cultural groups. Is that what you mean, Kira? Yeah, I think so. Like today we had uh, Bala Ramaholnas came and spoke to our class and he introduced himself as Ooh. like he was saying his mother is French Canadian and his father is Jamaican. And I was like, oh, that's interesting, right? Like yeah. not Jamaican Canadian. Anyway, uh, just sort of the default who's Canadian. Totally. Totally. And the whole default default of what Canadian means, and that's not a culture, apparently. Did someone else want to, did someone else get cut off? Yeah, Emily. Yeah, like I, and I was just like struck dumb when I read this. I was like, oh my gosh, of course, like queer culture, of, of course that's a culture. But like when I was thinking culture, I was thinking exactly ethno-racial culture. Um, but there are so many different ways to think about what culture is. So props to whoever wrote that. You gave me an aha moment today. Yeah, yeah. And I love, Naomi, you threw into the chat. It's also about people um, not knowing what language to use and um, sensing that language, particularly in an age of social media, um where our sound bites are we're reduced to a sound bite that language becomes um a a, a, a a way to judge what kind of a person you are um and how much and how you use language becomes a way to judge what your political place is um and so there's a there's definitely i think a careful a care around language and to be honest i don't think that um i think there are limits to how much we want to think about language one of the things that's really interesting to me about the way race gets um ethno racial groups um get thought of as cultural groups is that there is overlap right because if we think about the way racism works it works by segregating people right and I mean, whether that's Jim Crow or whether that's housing prices um, or whether that's um, how people immigrate and join together with family and communities form. But it does mean that groups who are defined ethno-racially have a, a shared history and history is the time that you spend creating culture, creating a shared worldview and all of that. So there is overlap, but um, there's, there's a way in which um, culture uh, can be so much more. And thank you for the first per who, person who um, posted that. Um, so when we're talking about um, culture, then we can think about how um, every group of people who spend time together and create, especially youth, oh my God, youth subcultures. It's all about creating a shared sense of belonging and then generating communication communication that um that expresses that belonging whether it's hairstyles whether it's music whether it's walks all of those so um yes that can apply to every group um and belonging is really important but i think that we also have to talk about inequality if we're talking about culture because culture as i say it's what groups in conditions that are an equal share. So I'm gonna do a, a little activity right here, um, which could be fun. Uh, I This comes from uh, a workshop uh, years ago with the South African Teachers Union. Um, and so social identity circles are a way of um, people being able to signal how they identify. Because what you probably notice is the less power you have, the more you're told who you are, right? Like if you're young and if you're low income and you go into a store and you get followed, you're being told your identity and why that identity is suspicious. Um, so the power to, do, to, to identify and for people to recognize that um, isn't, the same for everyone and it's usually about power so uh, social identity circles is a way for people to young people in particular to point to what is unique and what is valuable for them um oh yeah the less power you have in society kira yes the more you're told who you are 
whether you're being told to go back where you came from, right? Whether you're being questioned as to why you think you can do this job, um, whether you can handle this many, uh, you know, whether you're going to be busy with childcare, and so maybe you shouldn't handle this case because it's going to require a lot of uh, early mornings and working weekends. Um, so the cup, the ability to be recognized as this is these are how I identify. That's not shared by everyone equally. So. Social identity circles is a way for young people to take that into themselves. It reminds them that the way that they identify is directly connected to the relationships that are meaningful to them. And I'm also, I mean, I, I also want to hearken to um, Indigenous teachings about relationships, 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 relationships. Um, it, is our our because we we live in such an individualist consumer capitalist culture. We think that identity is a uh, you know it's like I bought a new identity today. Hey, um, and we forget that identity expresses the relationships that are meaningful and that I have a responsibility in those relationships. So I'm going to invite you to signal the relationships that are meaningful and that. Um, generate how you play, you know, how the role that you play. So as I say, this activity came years ago from a workshop in South African by South African Teachers Union. And um, they suggested that we belong to different groups, we play different roles in those groups. They begin with the example of a young woman, Thembi, who is um, a member of a church choir, um, who is a young woman, who is a sister, who is a Zulu speaker, who is a South African. And she signals that in her circles. And she also thinks about, um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna pause there and I'm gonna have you do that. And the way that I have you do that is now I'm going to be, now if you're on this slide in, as you're following along, you'll see, you can click on um, a little button there that says click here. If you're not, I will throw it into the chat. That's a Google Slides. Um, and choose one of those. Um, sort yourselves out if you want to take slide two, three, four, five, or six. Write your name in the middle and then write your social identities you know what are the relationships or the community that you identify with that are meaningful to you that you carry responsibility within um that shape your worldview that you actively participate in i'm going to give you a few minutes so what i'm going to do is while you're filling out your identity circles i'm also going to let you chat with each other because I don't think we'll hear from everyone um, if we just go one by one. Um, I'm only going to give you four or five minutes or so. Um, you'll notice that I've got other questions to think about that may come up in your discussion while you're sharing with each other what relate what social identities um, are important for you. Like, can you think of examples when social ident when demands conflict? Um, can you think about situations where one identity is normalized um, and others are not, and so you're hiding it, um, or it's the source of exclusion, or it's the source of inclusion, and it's not questioned because it's being normalized? Um, do you find ask moments when one of your social identities or one of the ways that you identify is also one of the ways that you have to work harder? to be seen, to be valued, um, to be included. So I'm going to be selfish because I was in one group and I didn't get to hear about the other group. Um, and um, I'd love to hear some of the things that, I'd love to hear some of the things that you noticed as you were um, even just filling out or thinking about the, the roles and relationships that are relevant and significant. I can summarize a little bit. Go um, ahead, Amanda. Yeah, just, well, just, I don't know. I feel like we kind of broke the ice at the beginning with some of us agreeing that we weren't sure what, uh, exactly what cultures we belonged in. And that maybe, uh, I don't know, 
that, that that reflected badly on us or something. But then the more we talked about it, I felt I know I started thinking of more and more um, ways in which uh, we kind of divide ourselves into different cultures and stuff, which was very interesting. And I felt like from what I felt with the rest of the group, everyone was getting ideas kind of simultaneously, which was cool. Yeah, we started to, I mean, people were generating ideas of like culture in terms of generations of a community that might be um, immigrant community in origin, but then there are gen generations of second generation, third generation. We were talking about culture in terms of um, trade or profession and what it means to uh, bring students into, say, a culture of cabinet making. Um, Mac, Mac, you've got your hand up. Yeah, I well, I mustered up the courage, so now I'm going to speak. But uh, no, we started out because we weren't really sure what we were going to be talking about and how to get moving. So I just decided to to talk a little bit about the way I saw things. And uh, so there's, I, I'm half French and half English Canadian, English Canadian, French Canadian, and and so I talked a little bit about that, about living those two sort of different cultures and and going back and forth, working in a French school board uh and uh but working for the english school boards which is kind of cool like I, I i like this position of being between both of them you know the two solitudes kind of thing so i talked a little bit about that and then shahina she she started talking and then we had to come back here and i was really i really enjoyed what she was saying so. i'm wondering shahina if you want to um elaborate on how you you filled up quite a few it's like you needed more circles uh -huh. uh yeah, the more I thought about it, the more I saw that I, I have all these circles around me that I didn't really realize before today. Mm -hmm. And you're defining those circles in terms of roles. Um, I'm noticing that also with Eliane, um, there, there are roles that you play um, and then there's heritage, um, that is a family connection, and then there are um, and then there are um, pastimes and recreations, which also form cultures, right? If you think about the way that youth subcultures might form around music, but then it generates into something more than that in terms of clothing and maybe ways of moving and favorite websites and your the culture is being made. And I do think that um, culture can have a different significance. Um, culture can be a lifeline as well, right? That form of belonging is a form of survival, um, even, even when it's under siege and when it's a, a, a basis for being excluded, um, that kind of affirmation of it then becomes a lifeline. And I think that's worth being able to have conversations with students about as well. I'm going to go back to my slides um, and see if it, oh, it's preparing them. Um, because when you, give students the chance to name the relationships that are relevant to them, a lot of things happen. Um, first of all, they have, as I say, a rare chance to represent themselves as opposed to being represented, right? Um, and the less powerful you are in society, the more you are defined. And you have to um, disprove how you've already been defined. And so there's something about taking back that power, which is, I think, part of why social media is so popular. It's a space in which the power is taken back to define I, you know, how you how you wish to be seen and what's relevant um, because it's a basis of, and so it's easy for us to think about culture and I think it's good to open it up in terms of what's relevant to me. And I think we have to balance this with an understanding that we live in an unequal world and that um, it's 
not everybody, you know, and that depending on ethno-racial class, language, gender, sexual orientation, citizen status, status, ability, the the ways that you are free to define yourself or are kind of already predefined, and it's a battle to disprove it. That's all about power. And so, um, thanks, Emily, yes. And if we look at the kinds of um, ways that um, students, that young people might um, name that are relevant to them, um, you, I think this would be even wider now. If you have a chance where students get a chance to, to say, well, how does it feel when your various, when one aspect of who you are is included or excluded? That becomes a way to then have a conversation around what kind of a community are we building? Because what does it mean to create, like, what is it gonna look like? How do we create a community here where um, people are bringing all aspects of who they are and that those are important. They're seen as important, not just as, and I think that's, um, so one of the ways that we can think about culture, um, I've said this, it's a sense of belonging and then you express it. Um, you'll, when you're in the, and when you can click on the link, I'm, I've got tons of links in this PowerPoint that can take you to other ways of thinking um, about and, and um, building up school culture and classroom culture and naming it as inclusive, but starting with the experience of what matters to me and how do I experience when that's included or excluded, when that's recognized or when that's ignored. Um, so I think we're pretty clear. And um, uh, the first post-it already pointed out that culture um, is not homogeneous and you don't belong to just one. It's not monolithic, it's intersectional. And if I move my head away, um, it can mean we, those circles were amazing, but there are also ways in which identity is predefined and that's about power, right? And so those um, in terms of whether you are, what does it look like to be able-bodied or not able-bodied or to be neuronormal or to be neurodivergent um, or um, to be, to be Anglophone, Francophone, Allophone, um, to be secular, um, those, I, those become identities that people, it's, 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 a, it's a definition that is predefined before you get there and you're always pushing back against it. And that's what I think our students are experiencing. So power plays a role in, um, the Lego blocks that you have to choose from. Um, so it comes out of those histories of power. I'm not going to go into, I'm going to leave that for the long, for the, for those who are geeks and want to go more into, um, into sociology. So I'm not going to go too much into that. Um, and, uh, I'm looking at the time. So I'm going to just leave you with some lovely YouTube videos that, um, in which young people speak about how their identity is intersectional. It's not just one thing. It's not enough to say, I'm um, Latina, right? It's, well, no, it's, that doesn't cover everything. It, and you end up being left out in single issue activism because apparently it only matters about this. Um, so what does that mean in terms of culture re relevant pedagogy is first of all, we're thinking about culture much more complexly, um, which is very different from multicultural education as it's been practiced in Canada. I mean, thanks Pierre Trudeau for you know naming it and the way it came about. It's it's allowed for a lot of pushback, but it has over the last fifty years um, certainly been practiced. Multicultural education can be about okay, this is your culture, so um, this is how we're going to affirm your culture. I'm, I'm thinking about a school in which um, because there were an, a lot of Afghan students joining, the school decided to start teaching the the kite the kite runner. And that's great because it was on the New York Times bestseller list and all of that, but there's no way to know that that's how the students were identifying. The only way to know what's relevant to students, and you know this as good teachers, is to ask. 
and is to create the spaces for the students to know that what they're going to share is going to be um, not just included, but it's going to be, um, I want to go through here, um, it's going to be seen as an asset, that what they're bringing in isn't just um, something that needs to be accommodated, but that it, they're bringing in something that is the, the necessary content to learn the, the, reason, the, the, the skills that we're here to learn. Um, so I was going to have us um, listen to, I want to um, honor uh, Nicole West, Dr. Nicole West Burns, um, and the folks at the Centre for Urban Schooling at OISE at University of Toronto. I found a lot of inspirations in the ways that at the Centre for Urban Schooling, there's been work on um, culturally relevant and responsive pedagogy. So I just want to listen to a minute of um, Nicole here. Based on our two bodies of work from the states, culturally responsive teaching and culturally relevant teaching and pedagogy, which come from a place of saying that we recognize that the schooling system is not for all students. Um, this work was actually predicated upon the experiences of Black students in schools in the United States, knowing that the educational system was failing them in many ways. And what this, what these two bodies of work do is they help us to understand possibilities for us as educators to think differently, right? A lot of the literature um, at the time that these two bodies of work came came forward was really tied to deficits, tied to black kids and their ability to even learn. And the creators of this work knew that these were nothing but racist ideologies that really fed that kind of thinking. And so what they said is we're gonna look at ways to make the educational environment more successful, but the onus is on us. Right? This is about a system that actually is a part of systems of oppression that operate in society. And so what can we do as educators to push back to that? So I always wanna be clear that um, CRRP is not a multicultural approach. Although there are components of honoring identity and diversity within, it is an approach that actually recognizes it's more closely tied to critical social justice, that there are oppressions that exist in society, that in order for us to, um, to really move students forward, that we need to recognize that and we need to address that within our actions. CRRP is an active pedagogical approach that is pushing back to dominant ideologies and pushing back to dominant narratives, while at the same time helping helping us to move students forward in classroom spaces. Um, in the Canadian context, in the Center for Urban Schooling in 2008, we pulled culturally responsive and culturally relevant together. We amalgamated them because we thought that they fit nicely together in terms of helping to build success. We also broadened it for us to think about culture, not in really monolithic ways, but culture as complex and tied to the intersectionality of identities that students have. And I think that's a mistake that we make sometimes. We wanna relegate certain groups of students to being one way, but identity is very complex and we need to understand that as we engage in this work. I have to apologize. Sometimes when you listen, I, like A, I really want to listen to Nicole Westburns because um, I think that there's very, a lot of what I can bring, given my personal positionality and history is quite limited. Um, and I think that whose voices we listen to matter. Um, in response to this. And so I think it's important to, um, I wanted to bring in um, Nicole's uh, voice, but I also know that when you listen to a video, um, your own attention goes, uh, it's hard to sustain. So I want to move into what that actually means. And I don't know if this is a familiar term for you, but Deficit approaches as opposed to asset approaches are, a, I find, a very useful way to name whether students' um, lived realities and the issues that are relevant to them, the goals that they're bringing, the ways that they are already literate and numerate and navigate complex worlds whether that's seen as irrelevant, as an afterthought, as an, something to be accommodated, or whether that's what is the place where learning starts. And so for me, when, um, when, it, when learning starts with that reality, that's an asset-based approach. And so I'd, I wanna go back to you right now, and I wanna take, um, again, another um, five or six minutes in um, two breakout groups. And what I wanna ask you is, if we think about, 
Um, and I'm going to pause here first to make sure that um, you can ask me questions about what do you mean, Lisa? What are you asking us to talk about? Um, so let me first say what I'm asking you to talk about, and then you can ask me for clarification. I'm curious in what your um, context is. Can you see examples, whether that's in the explicit curriculum, like the textbooks, or whether that's the hidden curriculum? Um, do you see examples when the cultural knowledge or the worldviews or the shared histories or the memory or the perspectives or the heritage um, or um, artistic musical expressions or norms or concerns or interests or responsibilities that students bring connected to their social identities, whether those are seen as irrelevant or exotic, or, oh, what do we do with that? Or whether they're seen as, okay, this is where our learning starts. We have to first get this together. Um, we, need to, we need to hear from this. Students need to be able to express this, to share this. And that's where we're gonna start building the competencies. That's where we're gonna start building the skills. That's where the learning is gonna become meaningful. I'm gonna stop there and ask if you understand what I'm asking you. <laughs> and I'm gonna say, does anyone feel up to summarizing what I'm asking you? Because I bet you could say it more clearly than I'm saying it. <laughs> the thing that came to my mind as you were talking, looking at all of these words, is just like, what assets do your students bring yeah. that are not recognized or are seen as problems? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And of course, recognize can mean so many things, right? It can be like, oh, that's nice. It can be like, let me give you an example. I'm thinking about um, uh, a teacher who was teaching um, the Canadian literature course, Canadian literatures, and she um, adapted it um, to be Black Canadian literatures and brought in um, singer songwriters and poets. And um, her students, predominantly Caribbean um, Canadian, um, um, teased her that she was teaching them English. And so she said, OK, fine, I'm going to give you a test, a vocabulary test, and you're going to give me a weekly vocabulary test on, um, on the ways that you speak English. Let's call it Ebonics. Let's call it Black English. And you've got to teach me vocabulary, and you're going to give me a test, and you've got to decide which vocabulary is relevant and why mix and you know and and you can test me and she used that as the basis of teaching vocabulary by switching it back to them teaching her so what do we mean when we say that it's included or that it's recognized again is it seen as that's nice or is it seen as oh or is it seen as hey okay how how is that going to how is that going to be part of what we're what you're here to learn. So I'm going to ask again, Risha, could you put us into um, two groups? Give us um, uh, five minutes or so, or maybe six, because I think it. Um, I think we need six minutes. Um, and I don't have a, a, a jam board for this because I think it's useful for you to just brainstorm. So bring ideas back. Um, I'm going to share back um, a conversation that we were just having in one breakout group, and I'd love to hear from the other breakout group. Um, and so in, in one breakout group, if you forgive me, I'm going to um, just give a quick little summary. There was an understanding of the way that something like the accent you speak with either gets seen as the sign that you're intelligent or not, and something that needs to be corrected or not. There's an example of a social identity that's meaningful, right? Because the accent reflects what the, 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 the roles that you play in a community, and that's meaningful. Um, so that is being treated as academic or not academic, as academically relevant or needing to be academically corrected or improved if you want to get ahead in the world. And then the other conversation was about cabinet making and working with wood and 
how can that be a place where students bring what's culturally relevant to them? Um, first of all, if we think in traditional ways, whether that's um, being Irish Canadian or Pakistani Canadian or being um, working class, in every group, there's a history of working with materials. And so for students to be able to name what's the history that I already bring of working with materials and what's valued. And then the other thing that occurred to me was when we make things, they come to mean something like the jewelry box from my great grandmother. And so understanding that what we make starts to become culturally relevant and to connect us to people can, can make it meaningful. And Eliane, you didn't respond when I was putting those ideas out. I, and I don't know whether they were completely from left field. No, they, they were actually very, very helpful and a really interesting way to think about um, launching that like from the get go, the, the notion of what people bring um, historically from their family or for whatever reason, what, what, what meaning um, and what crafts they already bring. So yeah, thank you. No, that's very helpful. Oh, I'm so glad it resonates because I, I, again, total humility, uh, humility. I'm not teaching in your classroom. I'm just riffing off of um, the, the material that you're talking about. From the other group, was there examples of including or excluding what students bring that occurred to you? We discussed the fact that we're quite privileged to work in the adult ed sector because we have no choice, but well, not we have no choice. I guess we could unilaterally not care about anybody in our classrooms, but when our students walk in the door, they come with such varying backgrounds that like, they, and we, you see it not necessarily race or ethnicity, but age, uh, scholas like scolarity. They walk into our classroom with such a range that we have to get to know our students. We have to talk to them because we can't teach, we can't meet them where they are, start where they are without having these conversations. And so you can have a class, you can be sitting in a classroom with a 16 year old student and an 85 year old student in the same classroom. You better believe their life experiences are different. And so when you're trying to teach a curriculum to them, you have to start at a point from where are you guys coming from? So we're privileged in that sense. And it's definitely coming from the youth sector. It's a shift where when I was teaching grade twos, I didn't see all of the life experiences that these kids were bringing in, I really saw um, their, their immigrant background or their language background and not all the other things that make up what is your culture. Um, so that part's awesome. Uh, but what we did talk about is our extremely limiting curriculum and exams that are culturally limiting and uh, dictated by the government and very difficult to make relevant for our students that uh, Gwen gave the perfect example of uh, an English exam where the students have to place, fictitiously place their parents in a nursing home or in an old age home. And her students are like, but we don't do that. That's not a thing that would ever, so we don't even know what that is. That's not part of our reality ever. And she's like, just, you have to just pretend. So the fact that we're given these tools to work with students is really about how can we approach our Quebec-centered curriculum from a culturally relevant point, like starting point for our students? So it's tricky in that sense. Yeah. Wow. That's 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 <laughs> yeah, that's that's the bane of our existence. And let's be really clear, this is about control. This is totally about control. Um, and I think what it reminds me of is um, the fact that as soon as we engage in talking about culture, uh, in thinking about culturally relevant um, curriculum, um, we're talking about power. And um, I'm gonna, um, sorry, I, I, this, this is gonna need me to get back to where we are. Um, it's going to get us to the point of, um, I would say, being able to talk with our students about codes of power. 
Um, I And so, um, first of all, let me say, in classic critical pedagogy, what we've been talking about is um, moving from students as empty vessels or buckets to students as um, highly competent in ways that aren't recognized or validated and who are apprenticing and expanding their toolkits. That's what's going on, right? It's not that they're coming in with empty toolkits. They're coming in with toolkits. They're coming in highly competent in navigating complex systems. And so I know um, that you know as good teachers that it's particularly, as you said, working with adults who have a very, um, you know, who have full lives and who are competent in very many ways in the world are not coming in as um, needing handholding and are coming in with goals. And so I know that you know as good teachers that your approach is you, the people in this room are already literate. You're already numerate. You're already polyglot. You already, you know, you have logic. You use logic. Um, you already navigate complex contexts. You already problem solves. You already create. You know, you don't come in needing to be taught those things. This is a place in which that toolkit is being expanded. And it, if we're talking about why it needs to be expanded, we have to talk about power. Which languages, which forms of logic, which um, forms of literacy are academically valued on the exam and then broader than that. And so how is, you know, and so I would say that it's useful for us to be able to make this clear with our students, but it also means that we generate ways of talking about power in our classrooms. Um, I forget where I put it in my PowerPoint, so I'm gonna share this with you now. Um, I remember all my years teaching English second language in high school um, and then in uh, adult education in, um, in, in Toronto and my students, you know, literally the entire world um, in, in one place. And I got into the habit of starting by saying, um, you know, here's a world map, let's just like, you know, let's map out our journeys to this spot here, this, this little classroom with its ugly walls and windows. And here we are in this little space right here. Me, I'm at the front and you, you're all in your seats. What, how did this happen? Why are all of you here learning English from me? Like, and then we'd have to understand the history of English, uh, you know, of European imperialism, English as a uh, lingua franca, as the language of globalization, English imperialism, essentially, and Cold War <laughs> politics and all of that. We didn't have to go into great details, but what it did was that it demystified any kind of authority that I could have. Because I also, um, I guess my last um, real encouragement to you is are there ways in which we can generate the capacity that we can generate a classroom culture where we can talk about power and we can see it for what it is? Um, and so can we develop a shared comfort about talking about social inequality? Oh, there's my anecdote. Um, and. I want to say that because a lot of people think that if you don't talk about it, if you talk about inequality, if you talk about racism or sexism or homophobia or classism or or linguism or any of those, if you talk about it, it means that's that you believe it, right? Um, and so that kind of let's avoid the uncomfortable topics because they're too sensitive. I always want to remind myself that I'm the one being made comfortable by that. Right? Because my reality isn't being denied when we don't talk about racism, when we don't talk about linguism. My lived reality is not the one that I'm having to shut up about when we all agree to not talk about it. So I do have some links um, around what does it mean to be, um, you know, what are, what are some ways that you as a teacher can uh, give tools to your students. How do we have conversations about power? 
Um, how do we name it? How do we name it in ways that um, still have a community where we're all learning together and supporting each other? Because otherwise, cultural inclusive pedagogy is going to look a lot like that. It's going to look a lot like diversity training. <laughs> and it's not actually going to do much. It's just going to look good. Um, so I think that's what I, I want to say with all humility to you is that if we think, if we profound, if we honestly want to be culturally inclusive, then we have to create the ways in which we as a community in our classroom can talk about inequality and discrimination. Because if I'm asking my students, I don't know, it's an English cl cl class, and we want to do um, an inquiry piece. And so we want to look at what issues are relevant in their com in the community where my students are living. Well, there's voter turnout, or there is um, access to services, or there is the way that the pandemic has had unequal impact on different families. Those are political issues. <laughs> <laughs> and so if we can't talk about the fact that the realities that students are investigating in their inquiry projects as a way of developing their skills and what they're finding is political, quote unquote, if we can't talk about that, then we're not actually authentically asking students to bring their realities into the classroom. I want to pause there because I think there might be ideas occurring to you. And I want to pause if you want to say anything. We're, we're getting a real brain workout today, Lisa. This is awesome. I was sharing with my group earlier that like, I think for my, uh, I taught history um, and for my history curriculum, I did, you know, work to make sure that more cultural groups were going to be represented in the history that I was teaching. But I think the reframe that I, the switch that I would do if I were going back into it is not starting from the history and trying to bring it to students' lives, but like starting from their lives. And then how can we explore the history through some of those experiences? And like, that's just being a, a big aha moment for me this afternoon. Oh, that's so beautiful, right? Like starting with, this is my lived reality and then saying, how did it get this way? But, and then in the process of how did it get this way? How do we talk about the way it got this way and still hear each other and still have a shared, you know, understanding of like, why does this matter? So what I think might be um, useful in our time that we have um, left is, um, which is limited. Um, I'm going to walk you through because I did put together, um, a whole bunch of resources. Um, it's my habit. I prepare way too much stuff for the time because I figure, you know, you might, um, want to explore further yourself. Um, so, um, and by the way, um, Frank, this is for you. Language is just a dialect with an army and a navy. Let's be clear on that, right? Again, the example of, um, of my friend Kirsten who said, okay, fine, you speak Ebonics. Um, I speak a kind of waspy English. I, my language just happened to be, you know, the one that got me a, a university degree, but your language, there's no question it's legitimate. So what are the rules? What are the grammar rules? Teach them to me, test me on it, make a test for me. Oh, look, you just learned grammar, right? So um, that kind of a shift around um, can happen depending on what your teachable is. So um, as I say, I've got some other um, resources in here. Um, in fact, I think what I'll do um, as I do this in order to, um, to show you where the links happen um, is um, I've give, I've just brought together a few resources if you want to think more in the summertime when you actually have time to think about how you're designing your your classes um, and your courses. 
Um, there are some great resources around inclusive design and designing instruction that I've got a link to. Um, there's a way of thinking about, um, am I just asking students to contribute? Um, are we changing what the curriculum is? Are we moving to social action? Are students using what they're learning to make um, some difference in the world in which they live? Um, um, the TDSB put out this beautiful um, little leaflet on anti-Asian racism, which has been going crazy since the beginning of the pandemic, and um, began to think through what does that look like in, in, in classrooms. So I included that. Um, the British um, BC Teachers Federation has a wonderful um, framework to work with that starts with inquiry and it's action oriented. So starting something like drinking water. Well, we can think about, okay, let me design the curriculum so that we're thinking about drinking water in terms of access, in terms of how students act in their lives, in terms of how they act together, and in terms of how they advocate. Um, so let me ask these questions, like these could be inquiry questions that could um, guide us in a unit around drinking water, whether that's in science class or whether that's in English language arts or second language. Um, classes. Um, I want to share with you that um, I've been working for um, a few years. My students work with um, uh, what I call um, social justice competencies, which I find are sometimes helpful to let me think about, to ask myself questions. Um, like when I'm planning the materials that we're working with. I can, I'm thinking about whose perspectives, about how groups are portrayed, about how it's being framed. Um, I think about whether the students are um, learning critically. Um, I think about how I'm um, putting the students in groups and how I keep my expectations high. I mean, again, I'm not gonna talk too much about that because I think that's what you're doing already as good teachers. The last, um, uh, do, 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 do a resource I want to share with you that I also find quite helpful is from um, the Center for Urban Schooling. Um, when they generated their equity continuum, they also gen and, and they said, well, OK, so, you know, we're thinking about classroom climate. We're thinking about school climate. We're thinking about student voice. We're thinking about how um, we interact with families, um, leadership, community and you know those all and cultural professional development which was what we're in the middle of right now yay um again i found um that they ask they give some good questions to ask one to ask yourself or to ask in a work group if you're um, creating a professional learning community um to develop curriculum together you remember when you have the luxury of time to do things like that um so i i share that um, that resource with you. Um, I came up with a fun little exit quiz because we're teachers after all. Um, and so um, does anyone want to have fun with this? These are two common myths about culturally relevant pedagogy. One is the whole point of it is to help diverse students feel better about themselves. Um, another myth is that if you're teaching in culturally relevant ways, that means you got to learn the learning style. So for example, your black Canadian students are going to need more movement and your Asian Canadian students are going to need to work by themselves. So um, those are good ways to be more culturally relevant. So for the fun of it, as an exit test, what did you learn today? <laughs> or ignore what I just said and just tell me where you think this is um, taking you, where you're taking this. I see, um, Frank, your screen is lit up. I'm not sure why, what I did to light up my screen, but just so many takeaways. I mean, you, you've given us uh, some, not to use a pun, but the hands-on approach. And I like the example you gave the vocational teacher with cabinet making and crafts uh, to hone in on what does building mean in your culture? And just a simple question like that and starting that kind of a dialogue uh, will certainly not, uh, demystify the myths you put there that it's not there to be, to make the student feel good, but to make the student feel like they're an active contributing participant and bringing in their knowledge of uh, what their culture does bring to be something as simple or as complex as cabinet making. So that's one of the bigger takeaways I've had from today. Yeah, starting and thank, that conversation. 
and and thank you, Eliana, to everyone who offered examples from your classrooms. Because again, if it were just me running this workshop, it would be useless. It, this workshop only works if we're working with your reality. Um, Amanda. Um, yeah, so my the wheels are definitely turning. I don't know where they're going, but it got me thinking a lot. Um, so Kira and I actually, we teach social integration, which is a program for adults with intellectual disabilities. So I've been thinking a lot while listening to all this uh, with that kind of lens of like the culture of disability. And especially the part when you talked about the deficit and asset-based resources, because it's something I've been like, I'm always kind of thinking of, but I don't know what to think of it or the idea of um, uh, that the, how it's, I'm just looking at the slide right now, how about replacing superior with superior practices as opposed to, you know, um, the, the community's own practices. Um, but it's also tricky because a lot of our students don't necessarily identify with that culture or know that they are a part of it um, or aware of it. So I don't know, that's just where my brain's at right now is trying to figure out how to bring in their perspective without knowing exactly how that perspective is expressed on their end and um, and how to bring out that value and not try and have them learn how to conform to the more powerful society. I don't know, like my brain's all over the place, but it's been very, very interesting. I'm really, that's, it's cool. Thank you. There's so much in what you just said. It's so, it's, it's such a beautiful example because um, it, it, first of what comes to mind is that you're saying that you can't know how your students identify. You can't know what relationships and memberships are relevant to them because also they're changing. <laughs> um, this is emergent. Um, and so it's an ongoing process. It's not like you can do a little um, a survey in September and like, okay, we're good. Now I know how to include your culture because that's also changing. So it's an ongoing kind of creating that invitation, a space that's inviting for your students to say, um, this is part of my lived experience that is that you're asking me about and then you're able to say okay now how does that lived experience connect to the issue or the literacy or the novel or the issue or the skill that we're learning and so it really is emergent um and then something else that you said was about um that your 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 students um yeah i think i i identify in 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 diverse ways, but they're being treated as deficient. And so again, creating a space where students are like, oh yeah, I can tell you about this, only happens after repeated signaling from you that what you're going, but what they're going to share with you isn't something you're doing to help them feel good. It's that you generally respect it. And again, I think you, you know, I know you know that as a as as a as a veteran teacher, as a good teacher. Someone else had their hand up. Emily. I think I was just thumbs up in uh, everything Amanda was saying. Because we've I just started talking to my students about um what disability is, because I have the quote of the less power you have, the more people tell you who you are. And now I'm telling my students that they have disabilities. And so I'm like, I don't want to do that. So we We've been freestyling a little bit this year and just kind of seeing, let, letting the words come out, saying the words and letting people, anyway, I was just thumbs up in Amanda. Lovely. And again, one of the ways that that social identities activity was working was, you know, your students are multiply able. And so it, for them to have a chance to identify and claim and demonstrate what they are already, the abilities they already have. And then to see that this is expanding those is very different than starting off from, I'm, you know, I have disabilities and I have, you know, right? Like starting with multiple numeracies, multi, like we live in a multimodal world. We live with multi, multiple intelligences. We start from there. And students can say, this is my toolkit. Now, how am I expanding it? And not all of my tools are going to be accepted in every space. That doesn't mean that they're not valuable. Does that make sense, Kira? Oh, yeah, totally. I'm, I'm nodding here. I'm <laughs> interrupting myself from stopping myself from unmuting and just going, yes, yes, absolutely, absolutely. 
Yeah. It's, it's, we, and in the class, I'm really big on, like, we also have been talking about accommodations more about, you know, going potentially into the workforce and being able to advocate for the accommodations you need. But also there are people within the classroom who can support you within those accommodations. So if you need a scribe who here is willing to be a scribe. So yeah, yeah. it's just, yeah, just a lot of like rapid sort of responsiveness. And it allows, it means that when your students are looking at different issues, you know, an issue that seems to only affect one group of people is actually affecting everybody. So there's a way in which, you know, the decision when we're renovating to not include um, architecture or ways that support differentiated students, you know, that's everyone's issue. So, right, like moving away from that kind of yeah, set. for sure. The like Being universal design of buildings Everybody's and issue. of learning. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> That's a great example. Um, Emily, you were going to give an example, and then I guess we've got a minute left. Yeah, just real quick. Like my role this year involves helping teachers, working with teachers to produce curriculum resources, digital curriculum resources. And so I'm going to, yeah, my wheels are turning too, Amanda. I'm going to have to think about like, how I think a lot of what we're doing is like play on me ready-made stuff that teachers can like use right away but how can we make it so that students have more space to bring themselves to the curriculum that's what I'm going to be thinking about after this like this I think we've all in the like, the groups that I was in we've had such great reflections today so thank you so much Lisa for being here and helping us think through these questions like Oh, it's oh been amazing. my gosh. No, thank you. Thank you. As I said, thank you. I want to end the way I started. I have such respect for the work that all of you are doing. And thank you for, you know, for even letting me think with you for a little bit. Um, and you've got my, you've got my email. Um, I'd love to hear back from you. Well, then I'm just going to ask, um, before we all leave, um, do you want to unmic? And I, and, and thank you again for spending the time together. I hope you have a great evening. Thank you evening. so much. Lisa and Emily and Mark. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Lisa. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was amazing. That was the fastest hour and a half much. ever. <laughs> I know, right? Yes. Thanks so much for coming, everyone. Thanks so much for coming.